Okay, so we are live. So hello everyone, I'm Vani Pandey, and I'm going to be your host for today. A very warm welcome to our Biologically Speaking webinar series. In this uh, platform, we discuss the progress and research that are going on in the diverse field of biology uh, through seminars and talks which are given by experts in the field. So today, we have a very special guest with us, uh, Professor Thomas Pukadil from ISA Pune, who studies the phenomena of membrane fission using novel model membrane binding system. After finishing his PhD from CCMB Hyderabad, Thomas pursued his postdoctoral research at the Scripps Research Institute USA, where he developed supported bilayer with excess membrane reservoir or super templates to study dynamic catalyzed membrane fission. Later on in the year 2010, he moved back to India and started his lab as, at ISA Pune. His lab focuses on working for uh, screening, uh, the screen set of proteins that actually drives membrane fissions using ingenious approaches and later on investigating their mechanisms within the cell. He has been highly recognized for his scientific contributions. And just to name a few, he was he is an HHMI International Research Fellow, and he got that award in the year 2017. And he also received prestigious Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Award in the year 2018. Also recently, he has been elected as a member of Indian Academy of Sciences, as well as Indian National Science Academy. Apart from his research, he also keeps interest in gardening as well as he loves reading scientific no science fiction novels. And I guess Arthur C. Clarke being one of his favorite author. So now, without taking any further time, I would like to invite Thomas to this platform and give his talk. All right. Um, thanks a lot, uh, Vani and uh, Saradeep uh, for the invitation. Um, and I really appreciate the, the time and effort that goes into putting up uh, these kind of events. Um, and I would also like to welcome every one of you. Uh, I know it's a Sunday evening and a Sunday morning for many people. And uh, thank you for taking the time to um, come in and uh, listen to what uh, we have to talk about membrane fission. So uh, if I could just go to the full screen mode. So as uh, Vani mentioned, uh, we are a lab uh, situated at uh, ISER Pune, uh, interested in the process of uh, membrane fission. And when you talk about membrane fission, uh, it's uh, a fairly widespread phenomenon, as many of you would know. Uh, we got uh, fission taking place uh, while uh, proteins are synthesized in the endoplasmic reticulum and get packaged into uh, buds, which undergo fission to form vesicles. And that's basically a primary mode of uh, uh, sorting and packaging and uh, delivering uh, the whole host of membrane proteins on across the diverse organelles of cells. Uh, a particularly interesting aspect of membrane fission is when uh, uh, large organelles like uh, the ER or the mitochondrion undergoes division during cell cycle, such that uh, each of these organelles uh, get partitioned equally to daughter cells. Uh, and obviously the, the Perhaps uh, the, the oldest form of uh, membrane fission is uh, occurring during the process of cell division, where uh, the final step of uh, cytokinesis is said to have not occurred unless and until uh, the, the bridge that connects uh, the two uh, newly formed uh, cells undergo severing, right? Um, so with that uh, understanding, um, when you talk about fission, we know a lot more with regards to vesicular transport. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, this is a pathway that manages to package membrane proteins into vesicles uh, such that they get delivered uh, to their destination organelles. And uh, with more recent imaging methodologies and chemical biology approaches, we uh, have begun to understand the, the rapidity and the fidelity with which these vesicles undergo severing and uh, uh, are finally destined uh, to the various organelles. What is shown here in this uh, movie is uh, a beautiful uh, piece of work that's come from the Frank Perez's group uh, where they trap uh, proteins in the endoplasmic reticulum. And in response to a small molecule, all of these proteins undergo exit from the endoplasmic reticulum to finally go into the Golgi. And from there, they are budded 
packaged into vesicles and uh, ultimately these vesicles fuse with the plasma membrane. Um, and what is particularly uh, telling about this movie is uh, the, uh, the, the kinetics with which uh, these vesicles form. This is obviously a triggered approach and therefore we can understand the, 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 the bolus of vesicles that are produced inside the cell. But remember this pathway takes place all the time uh, across all uh, the cells of your body and uh, it is uh, indeed a fascinating process. So um, simply put, uh, if you think about membrane fission, uh, one can think of uh, conversion of a single membrane bound vesicle or a compartment uh, into, small, uh, into two such uh, compartments. And that's uh, basically gives you uh, an impression of uh, understanding how uh, cells birth these vesicles. Uh, and obviously there's a lot more known about the reverse process, which is membrane fusion, where two uh, membrane bound compartments fuse with one another uh, to form one single large uh, compartment. And uh, if you look at this process more carefully, uh, you will understand uh, the basic uh, reasons as to why they're interested in this process. Uh, so uh, to put this briefly, uh, our research focus has been to understand uh, how uh, proteins manage to catalyze fission. There is a tremendous amount of information already available uh, from literature indicating that uh, it is finally the proteins uh, that interact with and bind membranes in order for these vesicles to form. Um, and there's also a fair amount of uh, good uh, evidence indicating that uh, membrane fission is an energetically unfavorable process and therefore very likely these proteins catalyze uh, this process. So uh, the lab has been interested in identifying uh, proteins that catalyze fission on a systems wide scale. Um, the ultimate hope is to understand their mechanism and eventually to place them in the context of cell and organismal biology. Um, and in this regard, it's important to uh, acknowledge all the previous effort that has gone into us uh, reaching uh, this stage. Uh, but having said that, there have been a lot of limitations in previous screens. Uh, these have primarily emerged from genetic or phenotypic based screens, either using siRNA or CRISPR uh, uh, knockout cell lines. And uh, it's not been very clear which particular protein uh, that's expressed inside of a cell participates in a process that uh, ultimately uh, leads to formation of vesicles. Uh, and some of these uh, problems are uh, pervasive. Uh, they are uh, found in practically all kinds of screens. Uh, these could be problems associated with uh, cell viability. If fission is, uh, is such an important process, if you knock down a protein that manages fission, then very likely uh, it leads to uh, a, a compromised viability of uh, living systems. Uh, the other problem is complex readouts. Uh, in the case of cells, uh, typically formation of vesicles is a multi-part process. And fission is just one aspect. So if you knock out any one protein, you don't know if you knocked out the ability for proteins to form a bud uh, or uh, if you knocked out proteins that uh, manage to sever and release vesicles. And the other big problem, especially in higher eukaryotes, is uh, the problem of redundancy, uh, which is uh, there are many isoforms of uh, the same kind of protein that manage to participate in similar functions and uh, possibly also carry out the same kind of uh, function with regards to membrane fission. So uh, with this in the in in, in the backdrop, uh, we decided to undergo uh, we decided to undertake a, a route that is slightly different. Uh, and uh, like I'd shown you uh, the scheme before, uh, if you think of uh, the reverse process of membrane fusion, uh, much of what we know about membrane fusion has actually emerged from very simple assays. Uh, these could be either energy transfer based assays or dequenching uh, assays, uh, which has allowed us to understand. Uh, the process of fusion. It's in fact the very same assays that led to the discovery of snare-like proteins and even viral uh, fusogenic uh, proteins, which is, very, which is very relevant in, uh, in the present uh, scenario. Uh, but the reverse process of membrane fission has not been studied very well because of the lack of uh, assays to look at uh, the process of uh, fission. And uh, it's in this regard that we decided to take an ultimate uh, route to understanding fission. And for that, uh, we uh, ended up uh, designing uh, a screen which is based on uh, a rationale which, is, uh, which uh, took us quite a bit of time to uh, figure out and hone and improvise. And uh, this sort of gets us into understanding an aspect of uh, biological research, uh, which uh, I must say is not very fashionable these days, but uh, actually has helped us tremendously in the past 
uh, to understand very uh, important uh, and very complicated cellular processes, and that's of membrane reconstitution. And uh, whenever you talk about, uh, I should say, uh, of uh, uh, reconstitution in general, and anytime you talk about uh, reconstitution, which is uh, to take purified proteins or complexes and recreate a cellular function outside of the complex environment of the cell, um, anytime we talk about this process, you can't but think of Arthur Kornberg, uh, who managed to reconstitute the process of uh, DNA polymerization in vitro. Uh, and uh, I would encourage all of you to, uh, if you get the time or if you haven't, uh, then pick up this really short pamphlet. Uh, there's an abridged version which uh, came out in Trends in Biochemical Sciences, which talks about the do's and don'ts of uh, reconstitution. And one uh, really important aspect in this case is uh, he obviously words is as uh, the Ten Commandments. And uh, if you look at the fifth point in this case, uh, he talks about uh, never having to waste clean enzymes on dirty substrates. And uh, when you talk about membrane fission, the substrate here is a membrane template or something that mimics an organelle uh, of the cell. And the enzyme is a protein that's likely involved in uh, catalyzing fission uh, of that uh, membrane template. So uh, in order not to uh, waste uh, uh, clean enzymes on dirty substrates, we designed a template uh, that took into account uh, the process uh, in some uh, detail. Uh, and uh, when you talk about fission, um, uh, one pathway that's fairly well understood with regards to membrane fission is that of platinum mediated endocytosis, where if you start with a planar bilayer, you've got a, 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 an extremely diverse and complicated host of proteins that get recruited to the plasma membrane. And in the process, uh, platinum ends up getting polymerized around the, around the membrane. And in, in turn, it uh, imaginates uh, a bud. And uh, as a bud acquires this highly curved uh, shape, uh, in the process, you also end up defining a narrow neck. And uh, it's believed that we got uh, specific sets of proteins that act on this neck to manage severing. And that's how you release a platinum coated vesicle. So if you look at stages right before uh, the severing reaction, uh, if you look at this particular stage, which is often referred to as an omega shaped structure uh, in greater detail, uh, then, uh, and imagine this whole process in three dimensions, then uh, you can start thinking of the neck as a membrane tube. Um, for the aficionados in the, in the audience, it's actually a, a catenoidal uh, neck-like shape, but uh, for uh, the purposes of uh, keeping uh, things simple, uh, we can start thinking of the neck as an elongated uh, 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 membrane tube, a cylindrical uh, membrane tube. Uh, and uh, we thought if we can start preparing these kind of uh, membrane tubes, then could that act like a nice substrate to screen for proteins that catalyze fission? So in order to do that, uh, we uh, uh, revised our earlier uh, set of assays that score for fission in order to start making these kind of membrane tubes. And the assay that uh, we use in the lab quite frequently is uh, described here in this slide. So uh, we start with a passivated glass cover slip first, and uh, we dry some lipids uh, taken from a chloroform stock uh, on one end of uh, these cover slips and uh, dry off all the organic solvent and uh, place the cover slip with the dry lipid on it inside of a flow cell and hydrate the, 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 the dry lipid with a, uh, with a buffer of choice. And in this process, just because of the hydrophobic effect, you end up forming large uh, membrane vesicles. And these vesicles are, <clears throat> are still tethered to the region where you spotted uh, this uh, lipid mix. And then we use the same flow cell uh, format to pass buffer at uh, extremely high flow rates. And in the process, what ends up happening is these large vesicles get extruded into very long membrane tubes. And uh, with time, these long membrane tubes settle down and that they get pinned on distinct uh, uh, regions uh, across uh, the glass cover slip. And uh, what ends up happening in the process, which by the way, this only takes about uh, less than 10 minutes or so to form this assay system, is uh, the region where you spotted the uh, dry lipid transforms into a nice planar supported bilayer. And uh, downstream of this, you have this array of uh, membrane tubes that are laid out nicely on a glass cover slip. Now, since this entire reaction is housed inside a flow cell, you can now do very straightforward uh, uh, fluorescence microscopy-based uh, analysis of uh, the severing reaction of these uh, membrane tubes. So uh, the other advantage with these kind of assay systems is um, because in every reaction, you have a supported bilayer that's formed, 
you can convert the net fluorescence intensity that emerges from these bilis uh, that's provided you dope these uh, lipid mixes with a trace amount of fluorescent lipid. You can convert the, the fluorescence per unit area of a supported bilayer and use very straightforward uh, uh, methodologies to estimate the size uh, of these uh, long membrane nanotubes. And that's what's shown over here in this, uh, uh, in this field uh, for my courses. So um, once this assay system is uh, set up, uh, these are fairly stable. Uh, the hope then is to be able to interrogate the functions of proteins that bind the membranes and uh, in the process, uh, would they uh, become membrane active in order for these uh, long membrane tubes to get severed into uh, tiny bits, okay? So um, when you talk about fission, uh, the field obviously uh, tries to uh, go down two parts. One is uh, to understand uh, in detail functions of the known fission catalyst. And the other is to uh, go on a discovery-based approach to identify uh, novel proteins. And we've been taking both of these approaches. And uh, before I jump into uh, the details of our work, uh, it's important to remember that uh, when you form membrane tubes, we try and functionalize the membrane composition in order that it starts uh, mimicking the lipid composition of uh, different organelles inside the cell. Uh, there's an enormous amount of work that has gone on to uh, us understanding how uh, different organelles uh, end up displaying different kinds of lipids and also different uh, uh, proteins. And together, this is what contributes to uh, conferring uh, different organelles with a certain identity. Uh, a simple way to understand this is uh, the plasma membrane is typically defined as an organelle that has uh, an enrichment of a particular kind of phosphoinositide, which is uh, the 4,5 uh, bisphosphate uh, flavor of an oxidite. While uh, intracellular membranes don't have so much of the core 5 uh, bisphosphate uh, inositide. So, if we are interested in understanding fission reactions on the plasma membrane, we would make these templates of uh, membrane nanotubes that are added on this glass cover slip uh, and incorporate uh, trace amounts of this particular phosphoinositide. We're still at uh, very early days here. Uh, the hope eventually is also to be able to uh, uh, exhibit specific kinds of proteins displayed onto these membrane nanotubes such that they start mimicking. Uh, each of these organelles in, in, in greater uh, detail. So, uh, like I said, uh, one approach that we uh, that people typically take uh, in this field is to uh, understand in greater detail functions of known uh, membrane fission catalysts. And whenever we talk about fission, uh, the first family of proteins that come to mind uh, are the dynamic and superfamily of proteins. Uh, and this is a fairly large family of proteins. Uh, they're typically um, categorized based on uh, the kind of functions that they have been attributed to. Uh, there is a family of endocytic uh, uh, superfamily, um, which is basically the class of proteins that manages to uh, catalyze fission of the next of platinum coated uh, uh, pits to release platinum coated vesicles. Um, you also have a different family of uh, dynamic uh, proteins which manage to sever large organelles like the mitochondria. Um, and uh, a separate category which uh, is uh, primarily involved in mounting an antiviral uh, response in, in, in a lot of cell types. And uh, this is also a superfamily that has members that are not involved in membrane fusion, uh, membrane fission, but rather the opposite reaction of membrane fusion. So uh, we thought we'd understand some of these uh, proteins. There has been obviously an enormous amount of work that has already gone on to establish that the endocytic uh, dynamic family of proteins and the mitochondrial family of proteins are involved in fission. But uh, can we understand more about the mechanisms of uh, action using uh, some of the assay systems that we have uh, devised? So in order to do that, we focus on the endocytic uh, dynamic superfamily. And uh, once again, remember, this is the protein that seems to get recruited to the mix of deeply imaginated platinum-coated vesicles, manages membrane severing, and that's what releases uh, a platinum-coated uh, vesicle inside of the cell. And uh, the uh, endocytic dynamics are characterized by uh, several domains that are present on them. Uh, most of these domains are conserved across all family of uh, the dynamic uh, proteins. Uh, but there are a few interesting differences. Uh, this is a, a family of proteins that is characterized by uh, a large N-terminal GTP binding and hydrolysis uh, domain. There's a middle domain that's involved in managing to uh, fold the protein in, in its proper uh, in its proper orientation. There is a plextrin homology uh, domain with which dynamin engages with the membrane, uh, and a few other domains that manages to uh, basically stimulate its GTPase activity upon 
some kind of a self assembly and by self assembly i mean uh, dynamic family of proteins are a uh, very interesting set of proteins that are known for their tendency to form very ordered arrays uh, helical arrays uh, when they are added to uh, uh, liposome like structures and shown here uh, is work uh, that is done a long time back uh, from the hinshaw group where if you took purified uh, endocytic dynamin and added it to negatively charged liposomes this is a protein that binds this membrane polymerizes to form these uh, helices uh, and in the process ends up distorting a spherical vesicle uh, or a liposome into these very long membrane tubes now remember all of this reaction has been done in the absence of any kind of gtp uh, so it tells you that uh, this is a family of protein that uh, has two properties one is that it tends to organize itself in in, in a sort of a, a an organized manner <clears throat> on the membrane and the other property is that it by itself has this tendency to bend membranes in order to possibly uh, take the process of membrane fission so much closer to uh, the final severing step uh, such that you uh, but out vesicles now as i mentioned earlier uh, these are reactions that are carried out in the absence of gtp and this was uh, an obvious choice because if you wanted to understand the structure uh, of these family of proteins you can't have gtp in the process because of uh, the possibility of uh, a tremendous amount of heterogeneity in these structures but uh, once you understand this kind of a state uh, it's curious to uh, figure out if uh, the protein by itself can utilize uh, the energy from gtp hydrolysis to manage severing and uh, there's uh, quite a bit of very interesting uh, history behind uh, dynamin uh, and whether or not they are able to catalyze fission and uh, these are primarily emerged from the inability to visualize these kind of uh, a possible fission reaction using em like uh, uh, methodologies that were uh, very prevalent uh, with regards to uh, this family of proteins so we decided to turn towards the endocytic dynamins uh, and uh, if you purify these dynamins and add it to uh, these membrane nanotubes uh, what is shown here uh, as this red uh, line is one such membrane nanotube um, that is just imaged for membrane fluorescence and when you add dynamin to them uh, you end up forming these uh, striations um, now remember these membrane nanotubes are typically in the dimensions of somewhere like uh, 50 nanometers or so in diameter and therefore are by definition diffraction limited so uh, the brightness of these kind of tubes uh, uh, is a proxy for uh, the thickness of these tubes the thinner these tubes are the dimmer they appear under the microscope the thicker they are the brighter they appear and very likely formation of these kind of striations reflects a tendency for dynamin to bind these membrane nanotubes and oligomerize uh, into forming uh, these kind of assemblies that were earlier reported using uh, em based methodologies and you can see this very nicely in the traces uh the blue trace is the profile of fluorescence along the length of the membrane nanotube before dynamin addition and the red is after dy dynamin addition and we find these very nice uh discrete and regularly spaced uh, regions of striations we of course confirm that this is indeed uh, polymers of dynamin because we carry out the same reaction in the presence of fluorescent dynamin then you find that every region that is dimmer in fluorescence and therefore very likely is constricted uh you find a polymer of dynamin uh, or a foci of dynamin localized in these kind of regions so this gave us some indication that maybe this is a good assay to to begin with uh, to understand the process of fission so uh we obviously then went a step back and we tried and uh, played around with scenarios where the cell would like to uh, involve this kind of a molecule in fission uh now remember i mentioned to you that dynamin is a gtpase and gtp is obviously a small molecule that's present uh, floating around inside of the cell Uh, cytoplasm and dynamin gets recruited uh, very likely at the next of uh, platinum coated uh, pits and uh, as soon as it binds the membrane it's very likely it is going to be recruited to the membrane in the gtp bound state so uh, how about we recreate that particular reaction instead of doing a stepwise assembly of first adding the protein in the absence of gtp we decided to mix dynamin and gtp and added it to these kind of uh, templates So uh, what's shown here in this uh, slide is a typical field of view of these arrayed uh, nanotubes. Each of these are these long membrane nanotubes. You can see this kind of there's some kind of heterogeneity in the fluorescence intensity, and this that's because of the heterogeneity in the sizes of these membrane nanotubes. And then you're flowing in unlabeled dynamin in this case with GTP, and as soon as it hits uh, this particular field, you can see this dramatic uh, process of uh, membrane fission. This entire long membrane 
each of these long, very long membrane nanotubes get severed into tiny bits. Um, so what you now do is acquire a, a, a movie of this entire severing reaction and play the movie back in time to understand what are the uh, aspects about uh, Dynamin that possibly caused it to function so effectively in uh, membrane fission. And in order to do that, uh, we've resorted to this methodology of understanding um, the, uh, the size of the, of the, of the constricted uh, uh, region on, uh, that is uh, present under the Dynamin scaffold. And uh, we find from these kind of analysis that uh, Dynamin ends up binding the membrane, uh, causes self-assembly, and in the process leads to stimulated GTP hydrolysis. And uh, the primary energy from GTP hydrolysis is channeled to constricting the membrane even further, such that you end up defining a specific lumen size of around four and a half nanometers. And the moment the membrane intermediate hits that uh, limit, uh, that's when fission takes place. So uh, this in some ways helps us understand the process of membrane fission using a protein that uh, is already uh, has had a tremendous amount of literature uh, with uh, regards to uh, the process of uh, fission itself. Uh, if you're interested in, in, in the nitty gritties of uh, this uh, kind of uh, analysis, uh, I would uh, request you to uh, look up uh, the papers that I published a while back. Uh, but uh, having said that, what this kind of a methodology also allows you to do is compare and contrast against uh, different Dynamin superfamily of proteins. I mentioned to you another uh, cousin of uh, Dynamin, which acts on uh, membrane organelles like the mitochondria. Uh, and uh, the mitochondria is uh, in itself uh, a fascinating organelle, but with regards to fission, it poses uh, one very interesting problem. Uh, the endocytic dynamics, remember, act uh, at necks which are typically in the order of 50 nanometers or so in size. But a mitochondrial dynamic has to sever this organelle, uh, and the mitochondria itself, in some cases, uh, is uh, is an organelle that's as wide as uh, one micro. So. Um, if these mitochondrial dynamics indeed have to assemble on this organelle and manage the severing reaction by constricting the organelle, then there has to be something very interesting about uh, uh, these, uh, this family of proteins. And we decided to look at this in uh, greater detail and therefore we expressed and purified the mitochondrial dynamics. And uh, if you run it uh, through these assay systems, then uh, the one thing that emerges is seems like evolution has invested in uh, tuning each of these uh, dynamic family proteins in order that they can accommodate and act on organelles of different sizes or substrates of different sizes. So what's shown here in this graph is uh, I'm plotting the probability that a tube, uh, one of these membrane nanotubes undergoes fission as a function of the starting tube size itself. And uh, the blue curve refers to the endocytic dynamics that I talked to you uh, about uh, in my previous slides. And the red curve appears uh, like the, uh, uh, refers to uh, the fission activity of the uh, mitochondrial dynamics. And as you can see from this plot, the blue curve, uh, in terms of its fission capacity, the endocytic dynamics uh, and their fission activity uh, shuts down as soon as the substrate begins to acquire a size of around 100 nanometers or so in, in, in dimensions. Uh, uh, mind you, uh, these are tube radii. So what it means is uh, if you present the endocytic dynamics with a membrane tube that's about 200 nanometers in size, then these endocytic dynamics are incapable of catalyzing uh, fission. But the mitochondrial dynamics, on the other hand, are uh, high capacity uh, fission catalysts. Uh, they can this, this uh, restricted range of uh, substrates on which they can act to catalyze fission is much wider. You can present uh, the mitochondrial dynamics with, with a tube that's as wide as about 500 nanometers or half a micron. And uh, they do still have a tendency to catalyze fission. So uh, what we are interested in uh, currently is to understand uh, in terms of design principles, um, what is different uh, between a mitochondrial dynamic from an endocytic dynamic. Uh, remember, these are all reactions carried out with purified proteins. So there has to be something intrinsically different between the mitochondrial dynamics uh, compared to the endocytic dynamics. And we hope to understand that uh, by uh, understanding the organization of these kind of proteins on uh, membranes of different uh, uh, sizes. And that's still ongoing. Uh, but the other side of uh, these kind of assay systems uh, takes us to a discovery um, uh, based uh, uh, approach, which is to um, 
ask this question, why restrict ourselves to uh, proteins that have uh, already been discovered? Is it likely that uh, there are other proteins uh, expressed in, uh, in genomes of uh, most uh, cells uh, that display this capacity for fission? Um, uh, and uh, in order to do that, we use the same assay systems to go on a screen. Uh, in this case, it's a biochemical chemical screen. Um, and the basis of the screen is very simple. Uh, you form these membrane nanotubes. Uh, like I said, these are arrayed uh, uh, nanotubes on a glass cover slip. And if you flow, if you use the same flow cell, you flow in lysates of different origins. Uh, then uh, since the severing reaction is very straightforward, the readout of the screen is also almost binary. You either have fission or you don't have fission. So that uh, gives us enormous confidence in, uh, in, in being able to screen for proteins that may catalyze fission. Um, and um, in, in doing so, um, you obviously have to now take a call on what kind of lysates uh, to use. And uh, over the years, we've been experimenting with uh, a large uh, variety of uh, different organisms. And each of these has been picked for a reason. Um, uh, we, uh, our screens currently um, uh, span across uh, very simple uh, yeast-like uh, cells uh, to very complex mammalian uh, tissues. And uh, one of the reasons why we picked each of these uh, organisms is because uh, there are specific pathways, uh, for instance, like vesicular transport pathways that have been described in each of these organelles. Uh, but uh, using the conventional uh, screens based on genetics or based on uh, CRISPR knockouts, uh, people haven't really been able to figure out what is a protein that manages the release of these kind of vesicles. Uh, so we decided to complement that large body of work that is already there for each of these organisms in going on a screen. Uh, and the hope is to be able to uh, identify uh, protein molecules that could be present in each of these organisms that may uh, allow us to uh, basically uh, uh, fill up that missing link in uh, understanding how cells form vesicles. So uh, the simple uh, route we take is uh, we start with uh, these organisms um, uh, grow them up uh, or isolate tissues from uh, uh, higher order uh, organisms uh, and uh, run these uh, and uh, prepare cell lysates or, or, or uh, tissue lysates, uh, pass these lysates, uh, give it a high speed spin to get rid of all uh, uh, unlysed uh, organelles or membrane fractions and take the cytosol uh, fraction or the, or the soluble lysate fraction and then run it through a desalting column to get rid of uh, all small molecules like metabolites and nucleotides. And that's typically our starting point. And uh, <clears throat> I'd like to uh, briefly describe about some of the results of the screen that have emerged from um, uh, the brain tissue uh, used as a starting source. So like I said, we start with a native uh, brain tissue, uh, homogenize and give it a high speed spin to uh, sediment all membranes. Uh, and then pass the lysate through a desalting column to get rid of small molecules and nucleotides and give it a very crude anion exchange uh, fractionation. Uh, isolate all the protein uh, or basically uh, collect fractions that are separated based on uh, their tendency to resolve uh, based on uh, uh, anion exchange and take each of these fractions and pass it on to these uh, uh, membrane tethered systems and uh, score for their ability to catalyze fission. So um, you can now start playing around with this uh, screen. You can take this lysate, add, uh, or take each of these anion exchange fractions, uh, which is what is depicted in the x-axis, and add it to GDP. And you'll see there's a fraction that's enriched in fission activity. Uh, that's fraction 7. You uh, take the same lysate, mix it with ATP. You'll find a, a fraction that's enriched in fission activity. Uh, that's fraction 4. And there is robust amount of nucleotide-independent uh, fission activity. And uh, at the outset, this, these kind of plots, although they're very crude, uh, it tells you that there are at least three separate uh, fission catalysts uh, present in, uh, in at least the brain uh, uh, tissue, which in itself is saying a lot because, uh, like I mentioned earlier, anytime we talk about fission, we typically always invoke the dynamic family of proteins. And these are all the GTP-dependent uh, catalysts. Uh, no one's ever talked about an ATP-dependent catalyst or, for that matter, even uh, a catalyst that works in the absence of any kind of nucleotide. Um, now, based on a, 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 a lot of analysis using depletion and using pull downs, we know that the GDP dependent catalyst is dynamin, uh, is, uh, originates from dynamin in the, in the brain tissue. Uh, 
the ATP dependent catalyst is obviously novel and we decided to look at uh, this particular um, uh, activity in greater detail and uh, following a, a fairly long drawn fractionation process followed by mass spec analysis we ultimately discovered that it belongs to a cousin of uh, the dynamic family of proteins but these are proteins that utilize ATP instead of GTP inside the cell. Uh, and uh, these belong to the family of proteins known as the EH domain containing proteins. And uh, what we know about uh, the EH domain family of proteins, but before that, uh, let me just show you a few sets of data that hopefully will convince you that uh, this is indeed, uh, uh, the ATP dependent fission is indeed uh, contributed by EHD. Um, and you can do this in a very simple manner. You can take that same lysate Pick an antibody uh, typically from that's available from a company and you know that it's a monoclonal antibody if it takes just one band on the gel. Uh, and if you were to take that uh, fraction and do a simple Western, you find this uh, particular protein that's a EHT. Uh, it's enriched in the fraction that shows highest activity. And then you can also take this antibody and add it back to uh, your brain lysate. And uh, it just shuts down uh, or significantly reduces this vision. So we're fairly confident that the uh, ATP dependent fission that we see from brain lysate is uh, dependent on or is contributed by EHD. We, of course, at this stage don't know if EHD is uh, sufficient uh, for fission. And um, what we know about uh, the EHD family of proteins are uh, that uh, mammalian systems uh, typically express about four different isoforms of this protein. These are all called the EH uh, domain containing proteins uh, because they have uh, uh, a fairly well represented uh, EH domain, uh, which manages a lot of protein protein interactions uh, in cells. Uh, and all of these proteins have a C terminal EH domain. So, unlike Dynamin, which doesn't have an EH domain, these are family of proteins that have an EH domain at the C terminal uh, uh, portion of the protein. Uh, these are, like I said, bind and hydrolyze ATP, uh, but nevertheless, because of their domain architecture, and because of their sequence of similarity to uh, the so-called G domain, they are classified as dynamic family of uh, proteins. And uh, there's been quite a bit of work that's already been done with regards to these uh, proteins. There have been uh, some very interesting worm uh, screens uh, and uh, some CRISPR-based uh, uh, screens linking EHT functions to the formation of uh, vesicles at intercellular uh, compartments. Um, there is no uh, homolog in yeast uh, known till date. Um, there's one uh, isoform that you find in worms, it's called the RNA one and another isoform, a single isoform that's present in uh, flies, uh, which is called uh, FAST1. And um, there's uh, this very interesting uh, result that's come out uh, saying that uh, at least if you knock out one uh, isoform of this protein, which is EHP1, uh, mice in a certain genetic background end up uh, showing uh, lethality and this is because of the lack of their ability to form uh, the cilia. So um, there have been suggestions that the ability for these proteins to form vesicles at intercellular compartments is what contributes to the birth and the biogenesis of uh, primary cilia in, 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 uh, in uh, tissues. And uh, if you don't have DHT, then you don't form cilia and obviously then you end up um, causing uh, lethality in, in, uh, at least in mice. So um, that's uh, sort of what we know about uh, EHDs. And uh, like I said, uh, we, we knew that the brain lysate uh, fission activity in presence of ATP is contributed by EHD. But uh, we wanted to address what EHD on its own is capable of, uh, for which we expressed and purified EHD. In this case, we tag it to GFP in order to be able to visualize uh, the protein and uh, go back to these assay systems, uh, mix the EHT protein with ATP and flow it onto these assay systems. And you can see as soon as EHT lands on these membranes, you end up forming these foci and by process of ATP hydrolysis, each of these tubes get severed into uh, tiny bits. So this is only the, the second uh, family of proteins known um, that catalyzes fission and in fact it's the first family of proteins known that manages to do so in an ATP dependent manner and uh, we wanted to understand the pathway that leads to fission with regards to the EHT family of proteins and if I can take you back to those uh, slides uh, uh, describing the endocytic dynamics I showed you that uh, these proteins end up forming foci on the membrane 
and each of these foci end up constricting uh, and thereby leading to a dimming of fluorescence on these membrane tubes. Uh, and uh, this in some way helps us understand the function of uh, at least the endocytic family of endocytic dynamics uh, in their ability to constrict and therefore manage to cause fission. Uh, if you carry out these kind of assays with EHDs, you actually end up forming the opposite uh, sort of intermediates. And what's shown here in green are uh, the foci of EHD uh, that are formed at very early stages during uh, in the process of fission. Uh, each of these foci, in fact, are now coincident with regions of brighter membrane fluorescence. So uh, by the logic that Dynamin ends up constricting these membrane tubes and dimming fluorescence, what this should mean is that EHD ends up organizing on membrane tubes and in the process expand or bulge out the membrane tube. Now, um, as far as the pathway to fission is concerned, a reaction that bulges the tube is not at all intuitive. And uh, we try to figure out how uh, these family of proteins manages fission. And uh, in order to do so, uh, we uh, followed the pathway to fission in real time. And we looked at what are the kind of intermediates that are formed at very early stages prior or uh, subsequent to uh, EHD forming these uh, foci. And what we find is what uh, EHD do very well, which is not seen with the classical endocytic dynamics is uh, the moment they bind the membrane, they use ATP hydrolysis in order to manage a polymerizing reaction. So this is a protein that binds the membrane, uses ATP hydrolysis to recruit more soluble dimers of EHD from solution in order to uh, manage this polymerization reaction. This is a, a, a reaction that is not apparent with the endocytic uh, dynamic uh, proteins. And uh, this is more evident when you form, make a chymograph of these kind of movies. So you can start seeing uh, if you draw a line across the length of these tubes and uh, plot uh, different um, uh, stages or, or different frames of these movies, you find a nucleation process, which then ultimately uh, ends up uh, recruiting more and more soluble oligomers or dimers of EHD from solution. And it starts growing uh, in uh, length along the uh, along the axis of the tube. Now, this kind of a reaction, uh, coupled with its ability to bulge the membrane, could very likely be contributing to uh, membrane fission. But it wasn't uh, uh, enough that we speculated uh, this. Uh, we then teamed up with uh, Anand Srivastava's uh, lab at IIC, who does uh, these really beautiful uh, coarse grain as well as uh, uh, molecular level modeling of some of these reactions. Uh, which are extremely difficult to do. Uh, and uh, with Anand's help, uh, what we try to do is understand how uh, an intermediate that binds the membrane, bulges the membrane, and also oligomerizes in the process could uh, carry out uh, fission. So what is shown here is one such uh, simulation. Um, this long uh, uh, band uh, is basically a, a membrane tube, which has somewhere like 20 nanometers in diameter. And on that, we place a protein scaffold uh, and we try and tune the, the size of these scaffolds in order to mimic uh, the possibility that EHDs utilize ATP hydrolysis to form uh, long polymers on, this, on, the, on the membrane tube. So uh, this is a starting point. And if you uh, now play the simulation, uh, if you allow the membrane to adapt to this uh, uh, long membrane scaffold on a, on sitting on this uh, membrane tube. What you find is in the process of its ability to bulge out the membrane, it seems like it draws out more reservoir from the membrane and leads to thinning of regions that are adjacent uh, to the scaffold. Now, the thinning can become quite extreme uh, provided these scaffolds are thick and uh, the tubes themselves are thin to start with. Uh, and uh, uh, thick enough, uh, and this, this kind of thinning is uh, strong enough that can possibly also lead to uh, membrane fission. So um, the sum of uh, all of this uh, kind of analysis is uh, we, we think that uh, EHDs are a family of proteins that uh, indeed manage to catalyze fission, but they do so in a manner that is very different from how the dynamic family of proteins work. They uh, bind membranes, they form these long polymers. Uh, these are if you will, uh, a functional equivalent of the cytoskeletal proteins like actin, which use ATP hydrolysis to, to polymerize, uh, but just that EHDs now do so on the membrane. Uh, 
and they form these very interesting intermediates which bulge the membrane and in the process leads to uh, membrane fission. Um, these are obviously um, still, uh, this is still very early days for us. Uh, this is just one possible model that we are now putting to a uh, rigorous uh, test uh, using um, uh, mutants of uh, this kind of a protein and uh, hopefully at some point in time also be able to trap these intermediates uh, and uh, be able to image these intermediates at high resolution using things like uh, cryo-electron microscopy. So, um, but coming to the cellular functions of the HD, I told you that this is a family of proteins that are implicated in forming vesicles at intercellular organelles. And by that, I mean, uh, there's one organelle called the recycling uh, intercytic uh, uh, organelle, which manages to, uh, so the whole bolus of uh, receptors that get endocytos from the plasma membrane uh, ends up reaching this endocytic recycling organelle where there's a lot of sorting that takes place. And a large fraction of these proteins essentially end up budding out in packaged in the form of vesicles and are sent back to the plasma membrane. And when they fuse with the plasma membrane, you replenish that pool of receptors that uh, were depleted because of endocytosis. Uh, and it seems like that recycling um, requires uh, EHD functions. And uh, if you look at uh, 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 either using EM or using uh, structured, uh, or using high, um, uh, <clears throat> high resolution uh, microscopy, you can uh, start, uh, it appears like uh, these endocytic recycling organelles are a collection of vesicles and very long membrane tubes that emanate from these. So uh, one possibility is that, uh, which has been entertained in literature previously, is that uh, anytime you form a long membrane tube out of these vesicular uh, compartments, uh, very likely you end up recruiting molecules like EHD and it manages to sever these uh, tubes in order to be able to form a vesicle eventually, which then goes and fuses with the plasma membrane in order to manage the recycling route of uh, 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 for cells. So um, these are just models and we've been trying uh, very hard to understand uh, 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 or basically at least correlate uh, EHD functions with, uh, with uh, uh, cellular uh, functions. And for that, we teamed up with uh, Kavita, who is currently at ISC. And Kavita is a worm biologist, and she helped that, us with uh, carrying out assays, which would help us understand membrane fission. With regards to EHD, remember, uh, I mentioned to you, uh, the worm has only one isoform of EHD. So therefore, it's very easy to do uh, loss of function analysis uh, with, uh, uh, with the worm. Uh, and the worm also presents a very interesting assay where uh, if you were to micro-inject fluorescent uh, proteins into uh, the pseudocelum or the body cavity of the worm, uh, then the intestinal cells of the worm end up uh, endocytosing the fluorescent protein. And uh, uh, it's the recycling, uh, endocytic recycling compartment where the bulk of all of these proteins are delivered. Now, if you end up with a scenario where recycling is perturbed, then Endocytosis goes on, but recycling is inhibited, and therefore you end up accumulating uh, a large amount of uh, fluorescent proteins in these recycling compartments. And that is apparent uh, if you look at the worm under the fluorescence microscope. You end up forming these very large uh, vesicular structures, which are filled with, in this case, Texas Red labeled uh, BSA uh, as a marker. And uh, these end up happening in a worm uh, which doesn't have this uh, ortholog of uh, EHD1. So um, the assay then is very straightforward. You just score for the number of vesicles uh, that are positive for Texas red in the worm. And uh, you can now build these very nice correlations between the in vitro fission activity uh, with the ability to rescue this defect uh, in the worm. Uh, remember I told you uh, EHDs require ATP hydrolysis for fission. Um, and that's what's shown over here. If you substitute ATP with a non hydrolyzable analog of ATP or ADP or don't provide any nucleotide, you never see fission. And you can make mutants of the human EHT and start mimicking these kind of scenarios. So, but before that, if you start with a wild type, you rarely find these kind of uh, uh, intermediates where the worm has a large amount of Texas red labeled. Texas Red BSA labeled uh, endocytic uh, compartments. Uh, but in the RME1 uh, background, you end up increasing these number of compartments. If you uh, express the human EHD1, you can rescue this uh, uh, defect. Tells you that the worm and the human uh, orthologs uh, should possibly be working similarly. Uh, but if you try and uh, rescue this defect with an ATP binding 
defective mutant or a hydrolyzing uh, mutant, uh, a defective mutant, then you are unable to rescue this. So it tells you, uh, gives you some confidence that what the assay, what our in vitro assay is reporting is uh, a physiologically relevant process of uh, endocytic recycling. And uh, we are currently in the process of taking this work to uh, mammalian uh, cell systems uh, to try and understand the pathway to fission catalyzed by uh, EHDs. So um, I'd like to uh, finish off now, uh, and I hope I've conveyed to you uh, that what our uh, assay systems establishes uh, is a uh, robust and facile workflow to understand fission. Um, it opens up the arena for uh, people interested in fission because these are assay systems that are very easy to rig. Uh, in labs, you don't need sophisticated apparatus uh, to make these systems. And uh, it, using these, we uh, we are just at the brink of uh, setting up uh, screens for uh, discovering novel proteins that manage this uh, process. Uh, obviously, some of these screens, because they are biochemistry uh, dependent, they circumvent uh, the problems associated with uh, the earlier screens, such as uh, lethality or uh, uh, redundancy. Uh, the readouts are very straightforward. Therefore, you can follow through uh, based on the activity of uh, proteins to figure out uh, uh, novel proteins with uh, fission capacity. Um, and they also reveal that there's more than one pathway to fission. If you look at a final analysis of how fission is orchestrated on these tubes, uh, then it's not like every uh, fission reaction ends up going uh, traversing the same route. But there are multiple different pathways in order for proteins to manage uh, severing uh, membranes. And uh, it truly is a gift that keeps giving. Uh, we have been steadily expanding the repertoire of fission catalysts. Uh, like I said, we have been looking at a variety of different systems and each system ends up presenting a very interesting uh, set of reactions. We have uh, uh, steadily been addressing uh, the origins, identifying the origins of uh, fission in uh, each of these systems and taking back uh, some of these uh, proteins uh, into cellular setups and understanding where they could be functioning in, inside of the cell. So um, with that, um, I'd like to acknowledge uh, everyone in the lab. Uh, this is a slightly old uh, photo. There are new members in the lab. Uh, we are a lab where uh, people basically use these assay systems, go on screens, identify uh, proteins, and then try and figure out or work their way backwards to understanding where in the cell uh, they are functioning. Um, uh, and uh, none of this would have been possible without uh, very generous uh, funding support from uh, the agencies that are listed there over here. So uh, with that, I'd like to uh, finish. And uh, once again, thank you for uh, listening. And thank you for the questions. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you so much, Thomas, for this interesting talk. And this is very interesting to see how uh, one phenomenon of fission is actually carried out by two different pathways. And the model that you have presented for EHD, where ATP binding leads to polymerization onto the membrane and the hydrolysis leading to um, bulging and fission, it's pretty interesting. Uh, and the, uh, as you said that the act and that uh, sort of you know matches or uh, looks like actin polymerization cytoskeleton polymerization which is kind of interesting for me as i work on cytoskeleton proteins and the protein that i work on also binds to the membrane so it's pre pretty interesting to see that so now i'll take up the questions from the audience uh, so first question is by sukanya uh, she says that what controls the uniformity, non-uniformity in the size of the vesicles and in turn the diameter of the tubes? Okay, so uh, this uh, gets us back to understanding uh, a bit of membrane biophysics. Uh, so uh, for a membrane which can be considered of, uh, as an elastic uh, material, uh, the size of these tubes is determined by the amount of uh, uh, force that you exert on these tubes. In, in other words, if you start with the vesicle which has a finite reservoir, if you go on stretching it, the tube starts getting thinner and thinner. Uh, the other important parameter is uh, typically referred to as the bending rigidity of the membrane or how easily can a membrane uh, which emerges from the kind of lipids that are present in the membrane, how easily can it bend or uh, accommodate itself in very highly curved membrane tubes. So in our systems, the force uh, comes from the flow of buffer uh, that you uh, exert uh, inside of the flow cell. Uh, the rigidity is, it's, it's a modulus, so it's constant in these tubes. Uh, 
So if you were to tune the flow rates of buffer inside of the flow cell, you can either make very, very thin tubes or very thick tubes. If you flow buffer at very slow uh, flow rates and you end up forming fewer tubes, but these are really thick. Uh, and if you flow a buffer at very high flow rates and you end up with very thin tubes, but numerous number of tubes. Um, there is a size distribution in every preparation uh, that we have. And we, in fact, use that size uh, heterogeneity to our advantage because we can now set up assays where we ask questions as to what is the upper limit of the size of the tube on which some of these proteins can function. Okay. So now we have the next question uh, from Manish. Uh, he says, that, sir, can you explain from vesicle shape which is due to hydrophobic interaction, but when converted into long shaped, what interactions are involved? So uh, you, there's still the hydrophobic effect is still uh, it, it, it's still uh, you, you never uh, uh, you never break that uh, uh, process. I mean, there's always buffer. There's always water around. The fact that these are formed as tubes uh, also is because of the hydrophobic effect. Uh, uh, but what ends up happening is if you start with a spherical vesic vesicle. You can exert forces because membranes are pliable uh, entities. You can exert forces in order to change the shape of these membranes. And uh, what we are doing is by exerting flow uh, or shear forces, what you're doing is distorting these large vesicles into very long uh, membrane tubes. Um, even during fission, it's not like you uh, deviate from the hydrophobic effect. And uh, it's believed that one of the reasons why fission uh, is a catalyzed reaction is because at very late stage intermediates, you literally have to uh, separate the membrane. And it's only there at that point that you end up going against the hydrophobic effect or you end up paying a penalty uh, to deviate from the hydrophobic effect. And that's where these proteins manage to uh, do such a, 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 a nice job uh, in that they, uh, in, a, in, a, in a very uh, nanoscopic uh, uh, region, they end up contributing to localized forces that end up constricting the membrane so much that you end up leading to separation and fission. So um, with regards to forming these tubes, these are there is still the hydrophobic effect, and that's why they are existing as a membrane. But at uh, stages or these intermediates that I talked about where there is extreme constriction, it's believed that uh, these membranes come so close uh, uh, or the limiting membrane around the tube comes so close in proximity that there's a likelihood of uh, merger of the inner monolayers and thereby uh, uh, this kind of an intermediate uh, results into a separation of the membrane tube and that's what ultimately leads to fission. Vani, uh, I can't hear you. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, I, I was muted. So yeah. uh, Manish asks, uh, the middle region in the endocytic organization, is it uh, contain chaperones which assist protein folding? Uh, I, I think you mean the endocytic uh, dynamics, right? Uh, and the middle region is uh, typically, it's these days it's referred to as a stock uh, region. Uh, and uh, there seems to be some tendency for the stock to spontaneously organize itself into a a little bundle, which then folds back on the protein to form uh, uh, a functional uh, dynamic monomer. The stalk is also the region with which it interacts with other uh, monomers and forms uh, uh, a dimer and then a tetramer. So dynamic is stable uh, in solution as a tetramer, and the stalk has a significant uh, role in making sure that it organizes itself in that quaternary uh, state. Uh, with regards to chaperones, uh, uh, there has been some indication that you require chaperones for the proper folding of dynamics, uh, but uh, I, I, I would, I don't know, I, I, I don't, I, 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 there's no easy way of answering this question because you can express dynamics in a variety of uh, recombinant uh, systems and they seem to be functioning uh, as well as uh, native dynamics. Um, so whether this is uh, intrinsic to uh, the protein or there is a conserved chaperone among all of these uh, uh, systems uh, is yet to be uh, determined. Uh, okay, so there's another question uh, from Sanchari. Uh, 
she asked uh, good evening sir my question is the is this membrane fission model applicable for pathogens who are entering our cells and also engulfed by macrophages yeah so absolutely i, th I think the other uh, uh, and something that we typically uh, almost take for granted is uh, uh, the formation of very large uh, either using a process of macrophenocytosis or other forms of uh, engulfment uh, cells have the ability or specialized uh, parasitic cells have the ability of engulfing very very large structures uh, and uh, these could be as large as bacterial cells and uh, in all of these cases these appear to be extremely uh, actin dependent uh, endocytic uh, reactions uh, but ultimately you still form a narrow neck which needs uh, to be separated uh, to manage fission um, there is some literature indicating that dynamins are involved in phagocytosis, but uh, there's more recent literature indicating that dynamin will not be the only uh, protein involved in uh, phagocytosis. Uh, and that uh, there are suggestions of alternate uh, proteins that could uh, act uh, to catalyze fission. Uh, uh, I think it's still a controversial field. Uh, there are There is fairly decent literature um, claiming that dynamins are involved in uh, forming the phagosome, uh, as well as uh, other uh, literature stating that dynamins are not involved. So I, I think the jury is still out on uh, which of these pathways are managed by dynamin, or they could be different forms of uh, phagocytosis, those which are dynamin dependent or those which are dynamin independent. Um, so this is precisely why I, I think it's important that we expand the scope of uh, fission, uh, try and figure out other molecules that could be functioning uh, in this process, and then go back to cells and ask if uh, each of these processes could be involved in these alternate forms of endocytosis. OK, uh, so we have another question uh, from Senthil. Nice work. Does EHT interact with any of the other recycling tubule regulators, for example, RAB11, RAB22, etc.? Does it have any role in cargo selection at recycling tubules through managing tube radius? Yeah, hi, um, Sendhil. It must be really either very late for you or very early for you. Uh, thanks for uh, the question. Uh, so uh, EHT is that they, they certainly do have an uh, interaction with the RAB uh, family of proteins. Uh, RAB11 is one, RAB22 is the other. There's more information on the bridging uh, factors between RAB11 and uh, EHTs. Uh, with regards to whether they're involved in sorting, uh, I don't think uh, it's uh, known, uh, it's it's not been addressed uh, very uh, well. Uh, there's been recent work from uh, the Spang lab uh, suggesting that EHTs may be uh, forming a complex with uh, other sets of proteins. Uh, the Spang lab calls it uh, the Ferrari complex, which uh, part of the role of the Ferrari complex is to manage cargo sorting. The other role is to be able to act as a, te as a tether. So uh, it's still not very clear if there's a direct uh, sorting function uh, that's attributed to EHTs by themselves, or because of their tendency to form these different complexes, they could be facilitating sorting. So. I don't think uh, it's it's very clear if uh, EHTs at least in cells manages the sorting reaction. Okay, uh, there are two questions from Sanchari again. Uh, she asks, can these novel proteins to be used in liposome formation for drug delivery in human body? Yeah, so uh, I mean, that's it's, it's, it certainly can be, but I wouldn't uh, recommend to go down this route. Uh, I think. Uh, the easier route would be just fill vesicles with uh, drugs. And this is obviously a, 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 an aspect that many people have been working on. Uh, I think in the 80s, there was this huge interest in forming uh, vesicles which display regulated uh, lipids uh, on them uh, and fill these vesicles with drugs of uh, uh, different kinds and inject them into, uh, into uh, organisms to see if they could uh, be targeted to different tissues and once they fuse with these cells of these uh, tissues, they could deliver uh, uh, these drugs. So um, people have been looking at this. Uh, people have been uh, making the next generation of uh, uh, liposomes, uh, which have uh, much more finely tuned uh, targeting and delivery uh, aspects uh, built into them. So um, uh, there, there, there certainly is a large amount of work that's going on uh, with regards to using liposome-like structures for uh, drug delivery. 
uh, another question by her is are tethering proteins playing any role in selection for the target of the cargo yeah so like i uh, in, in my address to uh, um, central's question uh, it, it's entirely possible i think uh, like i said i think uh, whenever we talk about a, a cellular process of vesicle formation uh, in addition to the fission there's a whole uh, uh, there are multiple layers of different uh, processes that uh, 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 work on membranes. We start by recognizing the right sets of carbon that sculpt the membrane to form a bud. And then it's only at the late stage that you end up invoking uh, proteins that can catalyze fission. Um, so, um, the, the, in fact, this has been one of the problems in the screens uh, because anytime you put up any one of these processes, you essentially don't allow for vesicle transport to take place. And therefore, your uh, readouts become uh, a lot more complicated. So there certainly is uh, a large number of proteins involved in this uh, pathway. Uh, we, uh, for the sake of uh, understanding uh, fission, we're focusing on that last uh, step uh, in, in the ability of proteins to finally uh, manage severing and the release of uh, uh, buds uh, from a, a donor uh, membrane. OK. Uh... So, Gyan asks, uh, could you please shed, shed some light on the possible mechanism uh, fission is carried out in ATP slash GTP independent manner? Also, any role of defective, defective fission in neurodegeneration? Yeah, so uh, the GTP, the uh, nucleotide independent fission reaction is something that we're still working towards. Uh, we have made some progress, but uh, I think it's still... Uh, it's still at early days for us. Uh, and uh, in fact, we have been seeing a lot of fission, in nucleotide independent fission uh, manifested uh, in lysates of uh, different uh, sources. Um, I would hesitate to say anything uh, about it uh, right now, but uh, stay tuned for more work from the lab. And we should be able to uh, figure out what uh, these proteins are, or at least be able to report confidently what these proteins are. Uh, regards to defective fission in neurodegeneration, uh, I think that's a that's an enormous problem. I, I, I think the scale itself is so enormous that I hesitate to um, answer that question. Uh, they could be involved in neurodegeneration, but then, like you know, degeneration is a, a, a fairly complex problem. Whether fission has a role to play in that or not is uh, is anybody's guess. Certainly, I'm I'm not I'm not qualified uh, to to talk about that aspect. Uh, we have one last question from Devnath Gushal. Fantastic work, Thomas. From your screen, you found a set of proteins that facilitate fission without ATP GTP hydrolysis. What proteins are these, and how do they generate force? I think it's the yeah, Devnath. Uh, thanks for your question. Uh, I wish we could meet uh, in person. I wish we could meet all of us uh, in person. Uh, but uh, thanks for uh, being here. Um, like I said, uh, it's still early days for us. Uh, we'll let you know soon uh, as to the identity of uh, proteins that manage this reaction in the absence of the proteins. OK, so here we are at the end. I had uh, one. I had a couple of questions, but I will ask one question, which I it's which is out of the talk. But I was just wondering, are there any are there any discovery for membrane fission protein or endocytic proteins found in prokaryotes, or have there been any studies of such manner? So there have been there are dynamic family of proteins in prokaryotes. Uh, the most well worked out family members are. Um, the proteins that are involved, at least I would say these are the most controlled studies uh, reported. Uh, and these are family of proteins that are integral membrane proteins, and they seem to be involved in formation of spores in bacillus like you know, organisms. Um, there is a really interesting class of uh, dynamic uh, like proteins in the mycobacterium. These are called the uh, any uh, proteins, and these are proteins that uh, apparently they're termed so because. They are the ones that uh, contribute to uh, mycobacterium acquiring resistance against uh, certain kinds of antibiotics. And uh, the, the mechanism there is uh, these any family of proteins end up managing to, uh, uh, so a lot of these antibiotics end up causing damage to the membrane. What the any family of proteins do is uh, 
sequester this damage by budding out vesicles uh, and thereby separating physically separating out uh, the damaged uh, vesicles. So um, there's there's uh, I would say there's a there's a completely uncharted field out there with regards to uh, prokaryotes. There are uh, enormous number of uh, 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 physiological processes that almost uh, give you reason to believe that there could be a dedicated fission protein. Uh, and it's not been, uh, I think it's just for the lack of uh, enough people, of, number of people working in this area that we don't know enough about these kind of proteins. But there's certainly, there's certainly uh, every reason to believe that prokaryotes also uh, display these kind of uh, reactions. Okay, that's nice to hear. So, so here I've come. We've come to the end of our webinar. Uh, I, on behalf of biologically speaking team, thanks Thomas for taking out time, especially on this Sunday, and uh, giving us a, such a great talk. Thank you so much. And uh, also, I would like to thank our audience for joining us in this uh, in this journey. And uh, I would like to. I would also request you all to subscribe to our YouTube channel channel and also uh, follow us on Twitter. And also in case you have missed uh, the previous two webinars, it's our, they are on, on our YouTube channel. You can go and visit them whenever you like. And uh, thank you all for joining us. And thanks Thomas again for taking our time. Thank you. And thank have you, a Mike. nice Sunday. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.